Hey everyone, it's Ross Anderson here from the Australian and New Zealand Boutique Wine Show uh, with episode number nine of Meet the Boutique Winemakers. Now, uh, we ran the Australian and New Zealand Boutique Wine Show a couple of weeks ago, it was about three weeks ago, and we had an amazing set of results despite all the challenges and hurdles that we faced with the 2020 uh, COVID situation. Um, but uh, we're celebrating 25 years of supporting the small winemakers of Australia and New Zealand. And as always, with these interviews, we aim to inform, educate and entertain you on all things boutique and share the stories and personalities behind the brands, which are the heartbeat of Australian and New Zealand wine. Now, today is going to be a zinger. This one's going to be a lot of fun. Um, Margaret River is a consistent producer of top tier wines across the board. Aravina Estate in Margaret River, in the northern part of Margaret River, is no exception to this. To quote chief winemaker Ryan Agus. Uh, we've got one of the best vineyards in the state down here, and I don't have to worry about anything except making wine, but we wouldn't want to be in any other situation. Uh, Aravina Estate, formerly known as Amberley Estate uh, until 2010, is making a mark for itself as a destination in Margaret River. Spectacular site, great venue, dining experience, cellar door, even a classic car and a surf gallery, uh, uh, also and fantastic wines. Um, this should be a bit of fun. I'm joined live from Margaret River by Chief Winemaker Ryan Agus, and I'm just patching you in here. Hello, Ryan. How are you? Really well, Ross. Very well. Thanks for taking the time to uh, say good day, and uh, hope everyone out there is having a good day. Absolutely. Well, it's uh, it's just gone nine o'clock uh, in your part of the woods. Uh, I hope you've uh, at least got a Chardonnay under the belt, or, or maybe a latte, one of the two. Um, Ryan, how are things down in your neck of the woods in beautiful WA? Uh, things are really good. I mean, we've been fortunate to um, have escaped the recent um, issues that presented themselves to the Victorian and New South Wales um, states in regards to COVID. We still feel like we're, the wheels are just starting to get back into motion um, in regards to um, tourism and consumer confidence uh, and people wanting to venture out um, in their own state um, for holiday, recreational and tourism purposes. So Aravina's um, been lucky. We're far more fortunate than a lot of other businesses in this country and we've maintained pretty strong growth and um, very good sales and, and good local tourism um, to help us get us through these tough times. Uh, it hasn't been easy. You know, uh, The owners have been on site um, since the start of um, the COVID um, issues and, and they've been instrumental in, in propelling the business forward, making sure it doesn't get stagnated in any way. Uh, and it's been really nice to have them engrossed um, in all aspects of the business and, and um, helping helping us ensure that we continue to, to maintain upward trajectory in everything we do, whether it's growing grapes, making wine, creating great food offerings um, and, and destination um, number one in Margaret River. So it's, it's been, been a challenging but rewarding period of the businesses. Um, and you think consumer confidence is there? It's coming back, or, or it never really left. I think it was. It took a backward step for the for the two months of the of the you know forced lockdowns and um, and changes to lifestyle. But um, I think consumer confidence is back. Christmas will be an interesting time. You know, borders are opening. Um, we're unaware of whether local tourism will flourish and grow. Um, so Haley, Haley's just walked in. Actually, she's the owner. Come and come over here, Haley. Um, just quickly, Haley Munro Tobin, owner of Aravina Hello, Estate. Hello, how are you? Um, Hi, Haley. How are you? Welcome. Good to see thank you. you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, passionate well? about the vineyard and the winery and um, all things Aravina, and a really amazing person to work with, um, as is Steve, her her husband. So it's been a um, yeah, it's been a challenging couple of months, but. Um, you know, with the confidence of the owners behind you and behind the business, um, we can push forward. Yeah, we're, we're accepting um, quite a lot of people coming here over the summer period as well to enjoy our wines and the restaurant. We are fully booked from the 27th of December, so that's a really great sign already. Amazing. So we're excited. Yeah. yeah. And Hayley, while, you, while you're here, let's do it. Um, Aravina, Chenin Blanc, yeah. trophy winner no. 2020. I mean, well, I know. the first we're time we've had a Blanc. Uh, so congratulations to you and to Ryan and to the whole team. This is an amazing result. Uh, I'm thrilled uh, with a Shannon win for obvious reasons. I'm expat South African from good 
20 years ago and we grew up on Shannon and we teethed on Shannon. I mean, we didn't have milk on our cereals. We had Shannon on our cereals, you know? So yeah. when I saw oh, Shannon, it's like victory. <laughs> so yeah. congratulations. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Absolutely. And and, and uh, Ryan, tell us a bit about uh, this amazing wine. I mean, was there something yeah, about 2018? Thanks, Thanks Um 2018 was something a really 2018, good yeah. 2018 was a really good growing season in Margaret River. Um, we had perfect rainfall over spring and the, the part of the summer growing season. We were able to get fruit really ripe um, phenologically and flavour-wise. So acid and sugars were kind of those weird years where everything's in check. We're not chasing your tail, trying to get sugar ripeness or dissipate acid out of the, out of the grape. So, you know, we're lucky up here we've got, um, some amazing old vines in the ground and, and the Shannon every year is very consistent. For me, Shannon on this property can be green apple or red apple. And I think the 2018, we sort of hit that red apple spectrum of aromatics and that kind of cinnamon spice and a bit of dried pear sort of fruit flavours. Um, and then what it did, it retained a heap of acid. So we had these beautiful, vibrant bunches with super, super tight acid. And what, what, what I do here is we hand pick it um, whole bunch press it and I roll the juice to um, old punchins 500 litre French oak punchins um, and I use one new punchin so the oak components sort of somewhere between 15 and 18 percent new oak equivalent so the oak is for structure and a bit of power on the palate but I want that varietal definition of you know of apples and pears and, and citrus flower to, to shine through and the 2018 was a really really good wine um it was troublesome through ferment like it didn't ferment as cleanly and quickly as what i'd like and it gave me a few sleepless nights but in my <laughs> experience the wines that cause you to lose sleep are the wines that are always well received um i think stylistically it's probably a little more on the the generous side because of the ripeness factor of 2018 whereas the 2019 which is a wine i really dig i think it's an amazing shannon but it's it's kind of a little bit leaner and skinnier and a little bit more richness of malo and batnage through the palate at the moment it's a bit gangly and, and looking a bit elbows and knees but it's a really intriguing wine for me and i think ross you'll dig it up you, you'll see a bottle of this um coming your way soon but what what you want to create when you make wines is you want to see um inherent vineyard characteristics every year and and that's what we try and do here. We try and grow the, the best grapes we can. So when it gets into the winery, we, we don't have to mollycoddle it too much. We, we put it into barrel, ferments cleanly. We leave it in oak for eight months or nine months or seven months um, and then shimmy it through the bottle. So um, be beautiful wine to make, great wine to drink as well. Like it's the, the wine I drink at home. I get a lot of pleasure out of drinking the Shannon. Um, and pretty pumped that it's been recognised as it has at such a – such an important wine show for smaller producers, you know, like we we punch above our weight in wine shows. We don't enter a lot, but I always support the Market River Show, um, the WA Boutique, the Alternate Variety Shows, Australian New Zealand Boutique Wine Awards and the Royal Perth Show. And, and every time we submit a wine, we get a medal, whether it's a gold or a bronze. Um, and I think that's really good because we've got one vineyard. We've got um, a, you know, a small parcel of fruit to work with from each plot each year and I, I think that's a real it's the really good ability of a property to be consistently producing um, high class wines without the luxury of having a parcel of Chardonnay from Caradale or a parcel of riper Shannon from the Swan Valley and and single vineyard um, and boutique winemaking is is all about um, you know making sure you capture the essence of the vineyard in your in the wines you make and and if you do that 99 percent of the times they'll sell well and 99 percent of the times the, the the consumer who is the most important person in our world will appreciate those wines far more than um you know multi-regional blend of this that and the other so yeah, we try, yeah. to, try to sell that story Ryan, on the Shannon, how old are the vines? I mean, uh, the, the oldest Shannon vines in the region. So how old are they? Yeah, they're like 33 years old now. So um, if you were to if you were to come and see these Shannon vines, they have got legs like a front rower. They're these huge trunks. <laughs> um, and they are just vigorous and healthy. 
and they glisten uh, and they're just beautiful, beautiful vines and they carry um, they carry a lot of fruit, but they have the ability to ripen the fruit. So um, yeah, it's a it's a special it's a special part of the vineyard. It's right on top of the ridge, so it's a really high part of the vineyard, um, and it adjoins our Cabernet Sauvignon parcel as well. And then the Shannon flows onto our Chardonnay. So the Chardonnay is south facing at the, one of the lowest points of the, the property, um, which kind of protects it from the the hot sun and um, you know the battering easterlies that come across from the desert. Um, but yeah, it, it's the beauty of this property. Is there's so many nooks and crannies and elevations and soil profiles that we can have 13 different varieties on the property and 13 different varieties all produce world class wines. Yeah. And and with Shannon, is there a what, what was the history of that coming into that region? Was there a South African connection, or was it just let's have a crack at this? Um, and, and yeah, and so what um, the the history of the property is it was a dairy farm initially. Um, so the, the land was cleared. Um, it is the start of a little tributary that flows into a, another bigger river um, down on the flats in Carbonat. So the the property was purchased by. Um, a small group of, of um, individuals. One of those individuals was Albert Hark, who is a South African um, by descent, and he was um, instrumental in um, designing and planting a huge percentage of vineyards in Margaret River in the sort of late 80s, mid to late 80s. He planted Shannon here, I presume, on the proviso um, of what he had seen back home. And what they discovered was that Shannon, um, not only did it yield really well, carries big yields, but it's resilient. It's, it's tough. It is resilient to pest and disease. And, um, you know, it loved our Mediterranean climate. And they, they had, well, we've got five hectares on the property. So it's 20% of our plantings. And they created a wine with Ambly called the Ambly Shannon. Okay. So Ambly Shannon was, 30 grams residual sugar, table wine, and so this has been brought in on the cusp of, um, on the cusp of Crouchon Rieslings and things like that in the Australia, and Fortifieds being the most consumed wines in Australia. So it was like a segue to dry table wines. You know, it was still juicy and luscious, but it had this this firmness of acid and this brightness of of fruit clarity, and it was really like a it was a conduit between old, older perceptions of Australian wine and where we are now. And this white wine became the highest selling white wine by volume in WA. Um, and it had this incredible trajectory. I, I, I think it got up to about 150,000 cases, which was massive. No one in Margaret River was doing any, not anything close to those numbers. Um, and then like all good businesses owned by individual <laughs> they got it to maximum value and then sold it to a multinational company for at that stage was in the ballpark of a record sale for a, um, an entity of its size in australia those guys um now deservedly so sit back um and they you know michael sturgeon sturgeon who comes in here regularly he lives in dunsborough and um you know a few of the other fellas they they live comfortably because of the risk they took, the foresight they had, and then the confidence in their product, Ambly Shannon, to be um, what Australia was looking for at the time. And and people still come into this business and go, do you have any Ambly Shannon? Now, Ambly Shannon, Ambly the brand, it's just a brand now. It's a virtual brand. It's owned by um, Accolade. Accolade still make a significant volume of that wine, but um, certainly nowhere near what they used to make of it. And, um, you know, the history of Ambly is, is really critical to the region because a lot of growers, mum and dad growers, farmers, they they put vines in on the back of Ambly saying, we need more fruit, we need more Shannon, we need more Chardonnay, we need more Cabernet. These growers are now some of the most esteemed growers in the region, with some of the greatest old vines in the region. And it's because Ambly prompted them to take a risk and a gamble, invest in agriculture, that, um, that they're, they're where they are now. So... It frustrates me a bit that Ambly doesn't get recognised in the light it should, but 
what I get really proud of and really excited about is how we embellish the history of Ambly on this property. You know, we don't care what the brand Ambly does, but we we are really proud of of the local guys who put this business together, who built this estate, who planted these vines where they have planted them, and um, you know, we'll be forever. Stephen Haley will be forever grateful for their their risk and their gamble in planting the vines where they have, because we've got some of the best vines in the region, if not the state, if not the country, you know, like um, I work for Accolade, Hortons, Barrel Hardy, and we used to buy this fruit um, in the transition period between selling and Steve and Haley purchasing the property. So it's really comfortable for me making wine out of it because I understand the vineyard quite um, intrinsically. And, uh, you know, it's probably really what helped get me the job five years ago was my confidence to say, this is what we can do. This is where we can go because I've made world-class wines out of this fruit for another company um, for many years. So, yeah, we're, um, we're we're lucky, mate. We're fortunate. And, Ryan, is this the vineyard you're talking about? Is this or is it not? I mean, you, I'm just looking. Actually, right that is the Shannon we're looking at um, from the top of the hill. So if you're looking down to the estate, it goes Shannon Blanc um, and then down into Chardonnay near the dam. So... Um, yeah, those those guys there. That's the that's the Shannon, and um, yeah, they're they're in, instrumental in um, what we do here and, and how we do it, and the you know the the variety of wines we can make because we've got those vines planted. I mean, we do so a, if I'm a, a um, sorry, yeah, yeah, we do a sparkling like a traditional method sparkling Shannon. Um, we do a uh, like a tank fermented, bright, juicy. Um, really fruit food friendly Chenin Blanc, and then we do the more serious, more winemaker nerdy kind of you know wine wine fire wine the block or Chenin, and they all come from relatively the same part of that vineyard. You know, there's a couple of rows I use for the block four Chenin. There's the top of the vineyard I use for the sparkling, and then uh, uh, ten rows of the middle goes into our um, A collection entry level Chenin. And um, you know they're all they're all different wines, but they all have that backbone of, of red apples and that beautiful lime citrus blossom and um yeah just just a cool variety like a really good variety it's getting a lot of noise at the moment there's a lot of push you know cliff royal i just judged at the market river wine show and um cliff royal who's the most chardonnay driven guy i know was actually he was the chair of the show and he was like it's amazing to see these shannons from the region being made the way they should be made with texture with power with grace with with oak work um to to create world-class wines and and that you know that makes me really happy that um people are starting to be aware of the variety and a, a shift in consumer awareness that it's not not just a sweet wine you know any any wine can be sweet shannon is actually a really great white varietal that has um unlimited potential you know, unlimited potential in what it can produce and unlimited potential in where it can go. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of, there's a big push from WA to to get Shannon back, you know, on the forefront of consumer minds and, and when they go to a bottle shop to not be afraid to try Shannon and when they go to a restaurant to try Shannon and and people like yourself and, and like Garth Cliff and, and, um, and other people who are pushing it, um, you know, hopefully they get some traction and hopefully, you know, we can um, continue to shine lights on not only Shannon but other alternative varieties that people have planted and, and are amazing wines to drink in our climate and our food culture habits, you know. So if I'm a punter and I come along to Aravina and I'm sitting at the table because everyone sits at tables now when we do cellar door visits and that's, that's yeah, cool, yeah. Um, yeah. and you're pouring this wine into the glass... What are you telling me? What are those flavour descriptors that come to mind with, with this block four? Like I always I always see in the block four, four this peeled red apple character. So think of sitting in the kitchen at home and you've got this peeler and you're peeling that red apple and you're smelling that skin, that kind of turpinaceous lift. And, and behind that, there's almost this like cinnamon scroll spice with a little bit of fresh pastry because of the, the kind of oak, the subtle oak complexities. And then... And then I always see a real burst of white flowers and and almost like this sea spray kind of character, this sort of pseudo estuarine sort of lift, um, and that creates intrigue when you've got so many layers of of complexity coming out of the glass. That's what you want. You want people to look at your wine, 
um, and and create a relationship with your wine and be tactile with your wine and and then you know so you've intrigued them, allured them with the nose, and then on the palate you've got like a burst of fruit that just kind of explodes onto your palate, but that fruit is carried through with this sort of bracing, swift acidity and a real textured palate that kind of fills your mouth, refreshes your mouth, and then makes you salivate. And you think, I've got to eat something. Okay, well, I'm going to have lunch. So is there any room in the restaurant for lunch? Yeah, and I'll grab a bottle of that Shannon. Oh, you make two Shannons, three Shannons. Let's try them all. So um, <laughs> it's it's a wine that kind of you can sink a hook into someone and reel them to the business and and – and then open the whole range for them, and, and they can learn about the story of Shannon and and the malleability of it as a as a grape, and um, and also the the cellaring potential as a varietal. I mean, I'm sending you a couple of older Shannons from the property, and, and they're 2011 and 2012, and those things are just smoking at the moment. They're drinking about amazingly, you know. So, um, Teasing. yeah, Teasing. it's a it's a cool, <laughs> it's a cool variety. I'm excited, and I hope those shenanigans get to you that I've sent over, um, just so you can do some comparative analysis and see what's going on there. Um, yeah, I'm going to do, yeah, I'll do all... a tasting for um, a heap of people and owners included, and I'll, I'll put them in, and I've got some other ones from the Wild and Loire and um, other places, so it'll be a pretty cool benchmarking tasting, I think. Geeking out on Shannon, this is awesome. But I want to know more about you, Ryan. You've got a cool yep. story. Um, tell us a bit about your journey uh, and, and how you got into wine and uh, where you studied and where you've been and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I, you know, I was I grew up and was brought up in the southwest of WA. Um, kind of went through high school. Not, I mean, everyone wants to be a marine biologist. I think when they're when they've got um, a bit of surfing and um, agriculture around them. But I kind of realised that you know there wasn't any jobs for marine biologists, and I had to probably move to the Great Barrier Reef to study it. I think it was Sturt University over there and, you know, I didn't really, I kind of realised I didn't really want to be a marine biologist. I just wanted to probably surf and go fishing and stuff. Um, so I just, I did an electrical apprenticeship out of high school um, and then sort of got through that and realised that, you know, it's cool and I learnt a lot and um, it helped sort of pay the bills. But, you know, I didn't wake up every day going, yes, I can't wait to go and wire up an air conditioner or something, you know, and, um, but it gave me a lot of skills and it, it certainly helped in my day-to-day -day management of a winery. So I finished with um, with electrical company I was working for and my dad, who was living in Warpole, which is a, a little place I grew up, a very small coastal town in the deep south of um, WA, said, oh, look, they're planting a big vineyard out at Franklin. So um, Franklin's kind of in, in the middle of nowhere, but a really amazing grape-growing region. Um, why don't you go down there and kill a bit of time and um, I can hook you up with a job. And, you know, so I went down to kind of the middle of nowhere uh, and basically pulled out deadly nightshade and paddy melons for three months, um, you know, hand weeding and training vines across these sprawling acres that were getting planted. This was in 99, I think. Uh, and this, all this planting was being undertaken by Ferngrove. So Ferngrove... Um, are a very big business down in the, the Great Southern. Um, at the time, they were building a winery as well. And so they said, you know, uh, Ryan, do you want to, you know, the vineyard work's kind of finished. Do you want to come and work in the winery? I had no idea what winemaking was or, you know, I I used to used to appreciate wine in my house, you know, with, with mum. Mum was a great cook and we were always had wine on the table and I was always having a taste of, you know, Pops wine and stuff. But... I couldn't I couldn't draw the parallels between grapes and wine and I can still remember you know tasting these beautiful rieslings these amazing juices with all these exotic flavors and then looking at the fermented riesling the wine and going geez what have you done to this it's dry and it's, there's no sugar and it smells completely different but then something in me twigged you know I had um, these Macedonians were doing the concreting around doing all the footings and I was digging out red ferments and they tapped me on the shoulder and I tell this story all the time, tap me on the shoulder and the, the father of the, of um, the family who were doing the concreting, he said, you come and sit with us, mate. It's, it's break time. And he handed me um, a, a crumbled wedge of cheddar, of yew cheddar, of sheep cheddar that they make themselves. And in a styrofoam cup, he handed me um, a red wine they make on their property, which is fermented in a concrete cow's trough. And it had this explosion of 
peppers and, and petals and Turkish delight and all these crazy aromatics and and, and I had a taste and I was like, oh, you know, it's a bit of, it's, it's alcoholic and it's dry. And he goes, have some of that cheese and then taste it. I had some of this cheese and it's still my ma- most amazing food moment, you know, like it was this cheese from this big concrete. He had hands like a, a giant and I sat on an upturned bucket and I drank this wine and ate this cheese. And he told, he said, this is what family's about. This is what we do. We, we make food, we make wine and we have them together and it brings our family together, even though, you know, there's a concrete truck turning 40 cubes of concrete behind him. It was really important that he got his sons and his wife was there and they sat down and they enjoyed this. And and that was it for me. I was like, I don't know how to do this, but I'm doing it. I'm going to make wine and I'm going to have an experience like that with my family one day. And then from there, I did three vintages with Ferngrove, um, Horton's, Horton's approached me to go work for them at a new winery in Nana. So I did three vintages for them and commenced studying sort of five years into working in wineries. I studied at Charles Sturt University um, at Wagga Wagga by distance. Um, and then that also, you know, allowed me to try. I worked for BRL Hardy and I, I worked in McLaren Vale and the Clare Valley. And I got to a point where they'd sold to Constellation and the, the decision for me was, do I go work at Bay of Fires in Tasmania um, and stick with the company or do I take a different route and, and and maybe head back to Margaret River or maybe head to the Hunter or maybe head internationally um, to get a get a, a job that probably will benefit me greater in the long run. Simon Osaka, who was my boss and, you know, you don't, I don't like to use the word mentor, but he was just really instrumental in creating a work ethic um a wine awareness, a wine appreciation culture, and and also um, an honesty, an honesty in yourself. And um, he said to me, "These are your options. You can go work in Tasmania for a business who probably may not be around for much longer, the way things are going with Constellation, or you can go work in Margaret River. Here's a contact, um, approach um, them and see if the position's available." So. I decided to come back to Margaret River in 2007. I started with Flying Fish Cove, who were a contract facility, but with uh, a 20,000 case brand behind them. Um, access to some amazing vineyards, had a beautiful vineyard planted in the middle of Williabra. Worked there for five years, had a really good time, learned a lot. It was my first kind of proper winemaking role. So um, it was a great, a great job. Um, and then went back to work with Accolade, who who owned Hortons at the time, back to um, the winery in Nanup, and I was there for five years as the, the site winemaker. And then, you know, um, kind of got to the point where I had a family and I didn't want to travel so much, um, and corporate winemaking is great. You get exposure to all sorts of amazing stuff and, um, you know, uh, you know, wines and whatever, all the, um, all the bells and whistles, but... I wasn't in any other, I wasn't making wine. You know, they used to have to drag me off the cellar floor and through vintage, I'd be hosing out presses and and, and whatever. And, and to the, the kind of the realisation that I, I want to grow grapes and I want to make wine, you know, I want to work for a small business. And and the Aravena position came up, you know, um, remarkably um, at the right time. And somehow I convinced Stephen Haley to give me the job. Um and I'm forever thankful and grateful for them having a gamble with me. Um, but we've taken the business to another level. You know, we've got a we, – they never had a winery here, so we've commissioned a new winery on the property. Um, we've undertaken some plantings and some really cool varieties. I think we're making the best wines we've ever made. We've got a great team working here who who do such an amazing amount of work for the business and, and are so, um, so well thought of and respected by Stephen Haley. You know, I'm working a really good mate of mine, Benny Day, is the head chef here. He's banging out the best food in the region. Um, and it's just a really nice place to be a part of, you know. Like, uh, it's you know, everyone from Cheryl who who takes care of the estate cleaning and, and makes it all look nice through to, you know, Stephen Haley, the owners. Everyone's a part of the team and everyone um, goes above and beyond what you'd need to do normally to ensure that, Aravina always looks its best, presents its best, and 
you know, create memories for people who come here and just get blown away by whether it's the garden or the gallery or the food or the wine, and and that's what it's all about. And and for me, I'm, you know, nothing makes me happier than pulling a few weeds out of the vineyard or lifting a few wires and then making a few barrels of wine and and um, you know, I don't know. It's just a I feel like it's a really good place. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's it's and, it's like. There you go. You yeah. Go. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say it's, it's really lucky because you get to be engrossed in the property. Like I live on the property, so my feet are on the soil and and you really get to emotionally connect with the property on a daily basis, you know. Um, and I think that really helps me make better decisions in the vineyard, which then allow me to make less decisions in the winery, you know. And um, yeah, I think I think the wines are doing well and um, I'm really proud of the pedigree of the wines that we've got coming out of the property at the moment. And we were just chatting just before we we, uh, we went live. Uh, you had a bit of exposure with a major international brand over in America. I mean, it's a global brand. It's a phenomenon. It was the first American wine I ever tasted. Um, and I tasted it in Canada, of all places. Um, and I can still taste that wine. I can still remember uh, the experience. And uh, that was Ravenswood. That's right. That's right. So with working for Constellation, I was lucky enough to be offered an internship to work in, um, to go to Sonoma and work for Ravenswood. I'd met uh, Morgan previous to that while he was working at Tintara. Um, Morgan was the son of Joel Peterson, one of the co-founders of Ravenswood. And at the time, every bottle of Zinfandel that was purchased in the world, uh, what was it? If, if someone bought two bottles of Zinfandel, one of them would be from Ravenswood. So hugely successful business. Um, you know, I'd never... Apart from Kate Mantell, I'd never tasted a Zinfandel in Australia prior to going to Sonoma. Um, I was blown away by the facility, the production, the sheer size of it. But what what really um, what really struck with me was the actual vineyards these guys had in their ownership. You know, some you, know, you think of I don't, I don't know. I didn't really know what to expect when I got there, but um, you know, you obviously everyone knew about the Napa and you know this kind of over-the-top opulence, which we don't see down in Margaret River or anywhere in Australia, really. Um, and then to go to Sonoma was kind of like the, um, the the ugly cousin of, of the Napa, you know. And and But the wines coming out of Sonoma were just mind-blowing, you know. And um, places and, – and the beer. The beer was like the, – the craft brewing at the time was just phenomenal. And I, I'd never tasted such amazing beers. And, um, you know, Ravens would – was really good for me in regards to, you know, working with people from different backgrounds, you know, and, and um, appreciating individuals and their struggles and, and their trials and tribulations to try and make a better life for themselves. And, and you know, some of my best memories were sitting in the in the smoko room uh, with with the, the workers from um, Ravenswood and, and them, you know, inviting me to sit down and have, have, have break with them and Having the the um, the corn the cornbread they make and the chilies and the, and the um, burrito bean mix and and it was, it was really nice to to feel like even though I was from another country and I was getting paid way more than them and you know I really didn't have to do any work I, I kind of could do what I wanted they respected the fact that I wanted to dig out fermenters and I wanted to help them wash great bins and um, I wanted to help them to make their job easier and um, yeah we. I struck up some really good friendships with, with some of the guys there and uh, it was a really nice time in my life and, you know, to see the success Ravenswood had and what they did for Sonoma was really impressive. And I don't know if you – I think that time in the history of wine has passed us now. I, I doubt there's going to be an opportunity like that kind of anywhere in the world, really, uh, India or other parts of Australia or South Africa or – but, you know, I think, um, you know, the ability for – for people to, to build a monster like Ravenswood became um, is past us. And I really hope that they continue to get the recognition they deserve because um, that was a really, really powerful business and a powerful brand. And I was, I'm, I was happy to be a part of it for the brief snippet of time that I was there. Right, let's talk Chardonnay. Um, another hugely successful set of Chardonnay results. Uh, gold medal for the... Uh, 18 Wildwood um, and a silver for the 19 Wildwood. 
Uh, tell us uh, tell us a bit about the shard on the property and maybe uh, touch on the differences between the 18 and the 19. I think, um, you know, we're really fortunate to have 30-plus-year-old Jinjin clone Chardonnay on the property, south-facing slope, planted in an east-west orientation. So it kind of evades all that hot, intense summer sun um, and is moderated by the southerlies, which are the predominant breeze we get over summer. Um, always kind of low yielding, which is frustrating because I want to have double the quantity, but, you know, we get sort of between five to six tonne of shardies a year, um, hand harvested, you know, always beautiful, clean, pristine fruit. It's very sim simple, whole bunch press it. We homogenise it in tank and then we roll it to, um, to French oak punchins and um, French oak bariques, generally about 35, 40% new oak, give or take. Um, I think the big difference between 18 and 19 is 18 is what I think is a true representation of Chardonnay from the property. Um, it has like, you know, obvious sort of um, yellow nectarine, peachy, uh, sort of spicy, um, spicy nougat lift from the oak and, and those white citrus flowers on the nose and then a real, in, real concentration of power um, of fruit and acid through the palate, which kind of puts it into, I think it's more of a fuller body style shardies. Um, and I really like it. I think it's a really good style for the estate. It kind of reminds me a lot of a, of the 2013 and 14 wines that come off the property as well. Um, the 2019, 2019 was a pretty tough year for Margies. We had late season rain, really cool growing season, really cool ripening season. So the 19, uh, we picked you know, um, probably a week earlier than what I would have liked, but we had 50 mils of rain about to hit and, um, you know, we sort of just need to make the decision to get it off. Otherwise, we could lose a significant amount of the crop to, to disease and, and things like that. So if 2018 is the classic, powerful style of Margaret River Chardonnay, 2019 is a bit more of the skinny hipster wine, you know. It's got a bit of funk and it's got a real line of acid and, um, you know, it's kind of in that uh, that new style of, of Shardies, which is doing really well from the region. I don't think it really represents the estate um, as well as the 18, but I tell you what, mate, people are loving the 19 and we're about to sell out of the 18. It's probably got 50 cases to go. And I've, I've put the 2019 into your show, um, the WA Boutique and the Royal Perth, and they've got silvers or golds at all of those shows. So... It's drinking really well. It's kind of coming together a bit more. It's not so oaky and funky. The fruit's start, starting to come up. And I, I think it's a really good follow-on from the, the 2018. I've just bottled the 2020, and the 2020 is back to sort of a bit more of the 2018 style, a bit a bit less oak, a bit more richness, a bit more power, and a bit more line and length. And um, I'm pretty excited about that wine as well. So I had a, had a couple of glasses of that last night, actually, and uh, it's, drinking, it's drinking really well. My wife... Um, just love Chardonnay. She used to work at Flame Tree and she now works for a, a beautiful little business down here called Thompson Estate. And um, a mate of mine's a winemaker there and he makes really good Chardonnay. So my wife's kind of like the the yardstick, you know, and I, I put a glass in front of her last night and she was like, Ooh, this is drinking really well. So that gives me great confidence knowing um, it's going to gonna be a well-received wine. And give us a bit of a highlights reel for the last 10 years since um, uh, Amberley became... Aravino, what would you say that the other highlights of this yeah. 2010? Yeah. I think I think if, if I was Steve Tobin and Haley and I was sitting back, I'd be incredibly proud of the ability of them to pick up a distressed asset. You know, it was a, a vineyard that was in a distressed state, a, a building that was hadn't had any money spent on it for a, a couple of years and and they've invested heavily in the property. They've spent spent a lot of money, but what you see there is how it is. It's a, it's a, a beautifully styled, an amazingly um, picturesque estate in the region, and um, that's because of their vision, um, their their commitment, and their desire to create a world class property um, in a world class area. And you know, everything was you know re trellis the vineyard. They planted new varietals, they um, redid all the irrigation and all the all the pumps and all the water moving mechanisms, built another dam. Then they, they added um, a whole function area to the 
um, to the building and redid the kitchen and um, you know it's just it's been this evolution of of a business and, and now it's becoming you know one of the most sought after destinations in Western Australia and um, you know we've got a lot of cool things happening again um, you know we're about to install our little nano brewery which will brew um craft beers for the property and uh you know not for any other purpose we don't intend to sell them or um off-site or or anything it's just going to be some really really good beers brewed by a really really good brewer on the property to sell through our new tap house um and to to give another point of difference for aravena and, and you know we're in a, a fortunate position where we've created a brand that um, we don't rely on anybody else to sell our wine. We 100% of our wine gets sold via online, you know, sales platforms managed by Aravina um, through the website, through the cellar door behind me, and the restaurant and the weddings. And it's rare, and we're we're really grateful. Um, yes, we'd love for people to walk into your local bottle shop and see our wine, but um, we don't really have enough wine to be able to do that. To have it dangling out in a liquor store for uh, a year, you know, selling a bottle here and there. And um, we want people to get our wines and drink our wines. And that's why we're kind of streamlining our online system where you can log on and mix up a pack of wine and it'll be delivered to your doorstep. So um, COVID has been good in that regard. That's given people the confidence to to seek out the wines they want and, and get them delivered to their door. And um, anyone who's selling wine via those methods online and, and, and things like that are seeing good traction. I, I do feel for the element of the industry where um, it's relying, a business is relying on a, a liquor rep to get out there and sell the wine for them because it's such a crowded market, you know, and, and unless you've Absolutely. got a great person working for you, it's really tough to get that bottle of wine on the liquor store shelves. So, um, yeah, we're, we're lucky. Increasingly and, tough. Yeah. What's, yeah, what's that? Increasingly, increasingly hard to get that bottle of liquor onto the shelves. The marketplace is just yeah, it, at the top end. And there's no space. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you know, so, um, you know, your mum and dad operators who, you know, rely on distribution methods and don't have the savvy tech capabilities, you know, they're losing a lot of market share, you know. So, um, yeah, we're, we're really extremely lucky here. And, um, you know, you create you create a, an entity like Aravena and one of the great things is that you control your own destiny, you control your own pricing, you control everything about your brand. Um to ensure that it's always presented in the best light you know we don't think we're better than anyone else we don't think we're worse than anyone else but we control what we do and that's a real rarity in our in our industry you know um ryan let's talk uh tempranillo silver medal yep uh alterna and emerging varieties well i mean not necessarily emerging but it, you know it's been around but tell us about tempranillo at aravena so um the tempranillo was is a five clone planting that was undertaken in 2013. Um, it's on one of the drier, warmer parts of the property, and that stuff is thriving. We've got so the the five clones are from um, from Spain, and they were you know new to the region. So we planted basically 0.2 of a hectare of each, and I've now got this amazing polyclonal mix of um of tempranillo which has taken me four years to get my head around um but i've identified that you know there's two clones that are more suited for table wine down here and three clones that are suited for um you know i guess more rosé and then entry level um shiraz you know shiraz temp and blends thereof so been really lucky to be able to play with that um we're grafting another hectare of the two two better clones over uh, on Tuesday, actually. So we'll have a, another, we're doubling our plantings of Tempranillo. Um, and I, I think it's a really good variety for the region. It produces wines that are so suited to our climate and our food cultures, you know. They're savoury, firm, dry, medium-bodied, super, super aromatic and, and, um, and bright and juicy. And, you know, I think I'm just getting my head around how to make make it and i think the 2020 is going to be a really good example of what aravena can do with its with its tempranillo um so yeah it's a uh, it's been a been a good learning curve but one that uh, i've enjoyed immensely 
And then Taravini, you grow a diverse range of wines, uh, and uh, we've already touched on the Shannon and Tempranillo, but you also got some Grenache and some Tariga in That's the mix. Right. What do you so, think so the future you, looks so, like for alternate varieties? I think I think alternative varieties are a way of insulating your business against changes and trends going forward. You know, climate changes, food styling changes, consumer changes. Um, Grenache is a is a very malleable variety as well. We can do a rosé base. If rosé does, you know, all of a sudden dies, then we can do um, a, a table red out of it or a blending component. And if, and if fortifieds come back to be the next big thing, we can fortify um, that variety as well. So it's kind of like hedging your bets, you know. Um, we'll get our first crop of Grenache off this vintage. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. And the Tariga is more of a... Um, bit of a scratch and sniff to see how it performs in the area we've planted it we've got 0.2 of a hectare which is probably going to give us one or two tons um again blending component table wine fortifying wine it's it's a really good variety to help fluff up other wines or an amazing um standalone table red so look, my goal here is to do like a um a grenache shiraz tariga a tariga temp cabernet you know a couple of weird blends that might change on a yearly basis but we can create a wine that is um in a probably in a separate tier and call it the whatever something kooky and and have it as like a, a really fresh bottle early bright juicy succulent red that is medium bodied and and um, has brightness and vivaciousness you know Brian, let's talk about your site, your location. What is it about the Aravina site that is making these amazing wines, these amazing, it's growing these great uh, grapes, uh, you're doing it all in the vineyard, but it's something to do with the site. What is it about your site that is so special? Well, I think we are very fortunate that we're almost the highest vineyard in Margaret River. Um, that altitude, uh, you know, 140 metres above sea level, um, gives us a two-pronged attack. So in winter... Um, we get plenty of rainfall, right? So our dams are full. We have lots of free draining soil. The soil profile fills up really quick, so we carry that moisture through summer. And then into summer, we have that orographical rainfall effect where if there is going to rain through vintage in the warmer months, it kind of pushes around Aravena and will, you know, dump on the Willy Abrupt Valley or the Carbon Up Flats or or kind of just go around us all together. And um, that enables us to be a really good disease free site so much so that we're you know we we don't we're not certified organic but we basically are organic practices in our spray regimes for our vineyard the proximity to the coast as well um enables us to have this moderating effect through the the warmer months that the the sea breeze will come in and cool the vineyard down and um and sort of slow down that phenological ripeness that rapidly occurs in summer and allow for that kind of diurnal shift between hot days cool nights and and as a result we you know our cabernet particularly remains really bright fruited and and super fresh with a huge backbone of acid and a really powerful tannin profile and um that's really rare to get that um balance right in the northern part of margaret river um you know because as you go further south things get more vegetal more cool you get sort of more spearminty kind of chop chip characters whereas you know, Willie Abrupt's, you know, the perceived sweet spot for Cabernet because you have a a nice balance of the two, warmth and cool, proximity to the ocean, good airflow through the Willie Abrupt Valley. Uh, but, yeah, Aravena's a bit of a rarity, you know. We we pick our Cabernet much later than most vineyards in Willie Abrupt. It's a, it's a late ripening site. Um, and, yeah, we, we re retain this kind of brightness of fruit and... Um, we have a lively, lively profile to um, to our cabernet um, that goes into bottle. And whilst we're talking about uh, the cabernet, we might as well talk about the Shiraz. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the features of the Shiraz uh, plantations? So we've got three clones of Shiraz on the property. We've got the Margaret River clone, um, which is your typical plum uh, beef cake clones, the bigger, richer, more opulent Shiraz. I, I, you know, presumably they call it the Margaret River clone, but it would be um, the Yolumba clone, one would presume. Um, and then we have a clone called BVRC12, which is um, was developed in the Barossa Valley um, Research Centre. And that's the clone of Shiraz, which is planted pretty heavily through the Adelaide Hills. And 
that has those white spice um, Christmas cake aromatics and that kind of a um, bit more of Middle Eastern kind of flavour profile of like cardamom and, and, and cumin and things like that. And then we have a Dijon um, clone, no, sorry, a, a Rhone clone called um, uh, clone, uh, it's clone 470 basically. So this is a, a clone of Shiraz which um, came out of uh, Lyon and is really red fruited and holds heaps of acid. So you move away from that plumminess and the darkness of, of typical Shiraz and you get into sort of the red fruit spectrum and that helps give our Shiraz lots of brightness and lots of freshness and, and um, a real um, depth of, of tannin and acid. And, and we, we create like a medium bodied, elegant style Shiraz here that sees a little bit of bunchiness and um, a little bit of other cool things go on there. And it's always received really well. We only make 120 odd cases, so it's a really small, small production, but um, is a, a really nice, nice wine to, to make and um, a pretty good wine to drink as well. Changing tact completely. Tell us about this. What is going on here? This is a perfect segue to introduce you to Steve Tobin, right. the owner of our oh, we're, looking at, hang on, we're looking at Steve's cars. Hey, Steve, how are you? <laughs> good, thanks. Good. And this is our little Charlie or Charlize Tobin, so next generation oh, winemaker. Hi, how are you? Teach you everything you know. Didn't take long. My days are numbered. My days are numbered. I've got... 14 years, I think. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, your time's up, buddy. You're out of here. Uh, while, while you're here, congratulations on the um, on the Shannon oh, Trophy. We were just uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, talking. We were Shannoning out, weren't we, Ryan? Yeah, it was, was a, a bit Shannon out, Ryan. We all got a bit glowy and happy. And um, yeah, it's, <laughs> a, it's a it's a big seller of ours. A, a, a great wine. So um, yeah, delicious. And and I'm sure Ryan's explained the history of um, of uh, you know Aravena and then uh, um, Amberley before that, as you know. A huge Shannon producer, so very well. We've been uh, digging, deep, uh, digging yeah. deep into the history. It's great. It's, it's really interesting what's going on. We were actually just getting to your beautiful car collection, and uh, Ryan was saying he's taking the Ferrari out on Sunday afternoon. Oh, but he's oh, not too far out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the, when the tractor breaks down, you got to drive something, yeah. haven't you? So you I, I was telling Ross Steve that I'm going to move the Ferrari out and put the yellow Kingswood in. So, oh, um, oh really? <laughs> He said he was oh, going to donate it. Most the, that Kings was worth a bit these days. You don't, uh, you, you don't let it rust away anymore. Absolutely. Well, well uh, t awesome. tell us about, the, about the car museum. Tell, tell us what's, what the story is with the car museum and well, the surf. Uh, sure. The um, that's that's an older photo of the car gallery. So uh, probably half of it now is devoted to the um, what we call the WA Surf Gallery, which is a, a sort of a a joint um, collaborative effort between Surfing WA and Aravena um, to establish um, one of three um, surfing museums in Australia. There's one at Bells Beach, I think, and one at Corumbran in uh, in Queensland, and then and uh, and ours here um, down at Yelling Up. So uh, so uh, it's you know the aim of it was to sort of um, uh, pay testimony to the the um, quality of the people, the surfing and the whole surf culture of uh, the southwest of WA and, and Australia generally. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a, a great achievement of everyone. All, all the boards in there are sort of on loan and the, and the trophies and, and photos and memorabilia from um, lots and lots of world champions that live in the Margaret River region, yelling up and, and all over Western Australia. So those um, uh, champions have been good enough to loan us all their their valued memorabilia, and and uh, here at Aravena we get about sixty thousand visitors a year coming through to to uh, obviously taste the wines and the food, of course, and the um, uh, see the surf gallery and the car gallery. Oh, so, man. yeah, it's it's a great thing, and yeah. and uh, helps um, put the estate on the map. So uh, it's all good. I was I was saying to Ryan right at the start, um, you you share a car museum with Boschendal in South Africa, which you may not be aware of. A big a big uh, estate. They have um, 1980s Formula One Grand Prix cars, um, old sports cars, old um, Le Mans 24-hour yep. cars, and then they've got the, the the car that Nelson Mandela arrived at the Parliament with, the, the bulletproof BMW. It, it's there. And so when, when I saw the <laughs> wow. car museum, I thought, wow, a parallel. This is great. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, well, our mantra here is, you know, there's something for everybody, and, and I'm, I'm a you know, keen car collector and always have been, and... And it's uh, we try and make it quite a an eclectic experience for anyone visiting Aravena. So it's 
of course, it's all about the wine and the food, but um, it's all about that sort of broader tourism experience and, and having the cars and, and the, now the surf gallery and the beautiful gardens and, and, of course, playgrounds and things. It's, uh, yeah, it, it helps to sort of broaden out that experience for, for people coming through. And, and it's lots of fun, you know. It's, it's, we, you know, this is a reflection of all the things we love to do. Um, and, um, you know, this movie poster collections here and, you um, yeah, there's a shrine to Bridget Bardot at the front door there sort of thing. Uh, uh, there's endless Bridget Bardot photos and in the Riviera bar. And and uh, I'm sure Ryan's mentioned we're opening our own, uh, bringing our own beers out and opening a tap house later, um, sort of after Christmas. So, so, yeah, lots of fun projects. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great fun adventure. You know, I've put my corporate days behind me and, and uh, yeah, very happy to, to spend my, my uh, post-COVID days down here. Well, I was just about to ask uh, Ryan about future plans at the estate. Is there anything you can share with us, uh, something that you're working on over the next couple of years? Well, it's been pretty quiet. So we're making babies. We're, we're having lots of babies. So And, uh, and uh, yeah, just great wine. And, and I think just, you know, broad, broaden out the tourism experience and, and, you know, hopefully we can keep the vineyard in the, in the family. From, you know, that would be... A, a perfect dream to have a sort of a multi-generational vineyard kept in the family and i think between ryan and the team all the hard work is getting done now so um so uh, you know my i'm busy spending my kids inheritance but um, my grandkids might thank me so um, so yeah that's the plan <laughs> we, hopefully charlie didn't understand <laughs> but she can watch this on youtube <laughs> well that's right and she goes, yeah, trade in the tractor or the Ferrari or something, and, uh, and get back to buy with that. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's a great fun lifestyle. It's it it really is the nicest place in the world to to spend the last, you know, COVID lockdown uh, months and whatever. It's uh, you know we sort of watch on TV the, the suffering all over the world and Victoria and other parts of Australia and think you know we're pretty fortunate over here at Margaret River. It's been a uh, a great place to um, to spend this last you know six or nine months. So. So not good for anyone else, but it's been a, a good opportunity to focus on the estate and the winemaking. Um, of course, you know, the food and the restaurants and whatever are all starting to fire up again now for this summer. Uh, and um, and it's springtime, so the gardens are, you know, everything's blooming and and the flowers are coming out and it's wedding season. We do about 50 weddings and events a year here, corporate events. So, so yeah, it's all starting to happen again slowly, I might add. You know, it's coming back slowly, but um, but you know it is coming back so that's oh. positive I'm gearing up for a busy christmas no doubt yeah hopefully yeah. hopefully and why uh you know ryan's busy um i mean we do we're coming up with new blends and um planting some new varieties and um, of course we we grafted um was it Sauvignon blanc over to some grenache and yeah and, and some tempranillo on tuesday so and tempranillo so uh yeah it's uh we're growing a lot of different varieties here now um rather than just the mainstream ones and, and that's making our ranges of wines really interesting so ryan's probably explained we've sort of got three three tiers our premium tier one and then the tier two is more the small batch all the state grown wines and and they are um you know they're the really interesting wines that sort of uh that um, you know, people sort of come back to Aravena again and again to to um, to, to try and taste, and um, and then we have the higher volume tier three wines. So, and uh, how he hooks people into the restaurant with the and yeah. <laughs> keeps dragging him through. Yes, absolutely. Well, he's part of our Tell focus us. group. Here, so. yeah. Or just part of the uh, focus group over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, while I've got both of you on the line here, tell us about your favourite wine memories, both of you. Oh, you can go first. <laughs> um, my, probably my favourite wine memory was um, I was at a Burgundy tasting in 2012 and I tasted the 2010 Bono de Martre Cordon Charlemagne and my head nearly exploded. It was like the most euphoric moment of my life. And, and I mean, you know, as a winemaker, you're engrossed in wine and vines and, and grape growing and things your whole life, but it's that one, that one wine that you drink and you go, you know what, I don't know if I'll ever taste a wine that's better than that. And that was, to me, that was kind of a revelation like, okay, that's the pinnacle. I want to get there. How do I get there? Um, and just to make sure that I snapshotted that wine in my brain, um, that hopefully one day I can taste a wine that does that again. Wow. How long ago was that, Ryan? 
It was in 2012, that tasting was. Okay. So a good memory, on nine years. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I don't think I can top that. It's uh, <laughs> um, uh, Well, our, our wines, I mean, you know, we've uh, in recent vintages, you know, we've had some amazing uh, Chardonnays and the Cabernets are, uh, are, you know, really to die for. That's delicious. And... And I think um, for me, coming from a corporate background, it's it's the revelation that I've had is is you know to appreciate the you know the, the slowness and the time value of um, of the development of the vineyard. Um, as you know, this was we purchased Aravena Estate from um, from Constellation Wines uh, in 2010, and um, you know, we have spent a lot of time, effort and, and love on developing the estate and, and that is reflected in the bottle. And and uh, as, as everyone knows, you know, good wine is made in the vineyard. Ryan's putting an enormous effort into the health of the soils and the, and the vines and, and the quality of the grapes there. And I think that's reflected in the wines um, being produced in, in the more recent years. So, so yeah, it's, I think what I've learned to appreciate is, is the evolution of the quality of the wine through the vineyard um and uh and a couple of years ago we put in our own winery again and and uh, having the control of all of that in-house is, is hugely beneficial to the quality and then uh and then of course pairing that with great food is is um it's it's a, a good life a very good life if you can if you can have That's that so, like, I mean, yeah and, and you guys they're and, making um, me hungry <laughs> it's terrible yeah <laughs> And then to top it off, have um, have the kids grow up here. Um, that's you know that's just a, a dream come true because you know it's the nicest place in the world, the southwest, and yelling up in the beaches and the and great people in this part of the world. So uh, so yeah, it's uh, we we don't miss the city and the, that um, corporate life at all. And we figure the rat race can do with two less rats, so we're happy to stay down here. <laughs> so Steve, when you take the Ferrari out, what's playing in the radio, or what are you listening to? Oh, when I take the Ferrari, out. oh, uh, oh, well, I'm cramming, cramming my Abba Gold album in there, but um, Abba Gold, uh, there we go. <laughs> um, uh, no, well, um, I had a few years of attending festivals in Europe and um, and uh, Germany and and um, sleeping out of a swag as well. So that was uh, that. I love the music festivals in. Um, um, you know, Glad Gladstonbury and, and the Hurricane Festival through Germany and, and lots of those things. So that was always new music. And um, oh, I'm just trying to think of some of the bands. But, uh, yeah, it was sort of indie music and other things in, in more recent years. So, so yeah, modern music, I guess, um, but uh, as well as the classics, you know, the Stones and the Beatles and... and um, Classic rock, yeah. All, all of that, yeah, from the 70s. I mean, I grew up in the 70s. That's reflected in the car collection. The best music. The best music. Yeah, <laughs> the best music. And that's, uh, you know, and I think a lot of people sort of relate to that era as well because it was more more of a carefree era, you know, long long days and weekends at the beach. And, and it was before um, the world became a lot more serious in the 80s and 90s and the internet came along and social media and all those things that add to the pressures of society. So, um, dare I say, the 60s and 70s were fairly fairly carefree and, and lots of fun and um yeah i think a lot of people sort of hark back to those the fondness of those days and and um and the simplicity of life actually so so that's what we're trying to recreate down here ryan same question to you when you're driving the ute what's on the radio Mate, I, I kind of it's funny i have a lot of parallels with steve and my music taste i um if you come home to the winery on any given day there'll be bob seeger playing there'll probably be a bit yeah. of umi um yeah and then, you know, kind of, I guess, everything in between, you know, Australian classics, a bit of Aussie crawl, uh, you know, and then, a, you know, a bit of a bogan deep down, so I like a bit of Metallica and ACDC and um, oh, a <laughs> broad range there. Um, Actually, maybe you don't want to go to the right yeah. one. <laughs> Sometimes I have to rush over to the <laughs> and, and mute, mute my phone because uh, there's some crazy stuff getting played. But, no, nah, look, I think uh, rock rock and, and uh, you know, contemporary sort of rock is where I'm that and you know, Aaron, um, yeah. saying all yeah. the right things, right. guys. Let's put a wrap on this. Tell us, uh, we can buy the wines online at aravinaestate.com. The website's on the bottom. Uh, follow uh, Aravina on Facebook at Aravina Estate or on Insta at Aravina Estate. Um, is there a club people can sign up to to join? We're just in the process, we're just putting the icing on the cake for the wine club. 
we hope to launch it over summer. Um, yep. But our online portals will be able to take you through and you can sign up to our um, member base um, to get our newsletter. And that's how you get like the um, the deals, you know, the online deals that come through via um, web platforms. So um, if you want to buy wine, jump online and uh, we will look after you and get that wine to your doorstep in the blink of an eye. Absolutely. All right. Well, yeah. you heard it there first, yeah. folks. Um, this is it. Oh, sorry. Steve, go for it. I was just going to say, we the, the wine club has been going quite quite a long time. It's got close to ten thousand members, but we're sort of rebranding it and relaunching it um, in the next month. And there'll be lots of special offers there, and and lots of sort of value adds for those those customers that are repeat customers and come down to our arena. So, so yeah. But uh, as Ryan said, you know the the um, limited releases, early releases, uh, and the really good specials are available through the wine club. So it's called Club Aravina, at least the relaunch version will be Club Aravina. And, um, and yeah, we're trying to um, uh, really reward people for their, their loyalty of, um, of supporting the vineyard through the years and, and coming down and visiting again and again. So it's, uh, it's, uh, we think it's a great thing to sort of, um, you know, help, help people understand what the estate's all about and hopefully get them to come down. And okay, we'll let you go, mate. But roll on December one so we can get these results out there. It's just we around the corner. Itching <laughs> to tell people about the success. Absolutely. Well, as soon as this is live, uh, people already know. So, um, uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us, Steve. Thanks for popping in. Uh, please thank Haley for uh, popping in as well. It's great to meet uh, her, even though it's virtually. Uh, don't go away for a sec. I'm just going to do a wrap. All right, everyone. So that was awesome. That was one of the best we've done. Uh, these guys are passionate about what they're doing in Aravina. I encourage you to get onto Aravina, uh, onto their website, uh, aravinaestate.com. Try these wines. You will not be disappointed. This is going to sell fast. It's probably already almost sold out. So if you want to get onto it, uh, it's the Block 4 Shannon 2018. But please try all the wines, the, the two Chardonnays, the Tempranillo, Shiraz, the Cabernet, and try the whole range. Put yourself a mixed case together. Get it delivered for Christmas. That's it for this episode. Stay tuned, uh, stay safe, and we'll talk soon.